I'm and I'm the youth and young adult pastor here at First Baptist Surfside, and we're so glad that you decided to worship with us this morning. Uh, if you happen to be a guest with us, uh, we're so glad you're here. Uh, we'd love it if you would fill out a Connect card. There should be one in the seat back in front of you, uh, and you can just drop that off in the offering plate when it goes by. Uh, we have a few announcements this morning. Uh, first, the Angel Tree gifts are due today. Uh, families will start getting those gifts tomorrow, uh, so today is the deadline. Uh, also today, uh, later this afternoon, we are going Christmas caroling. So we have no other acti- evening activities tonight, so you're all free to come back today at 4 o'clock. Uh, we're going to visit some nursing homes and a few shut-ins, um, and then we're going to return back here to the fellowship hall uh, for dinner and hot chocolate and fellowship together. Uh, so again, if you're planning to come, meet here at 4 o'clock Uh, and we'll give you directions from there. Also, next Sunday night uh, is our candlelight service uh, at 6 p.m. We're going to have child care for those age four and under, but I hope you make plans to come back next Sunday night. That's going to be really a really sweet service. Also, on Christmas Day and New Year's Day, we're only going to have one service at 10 a.m., so we're not going to have small groups that morning or any evening activities, just just one service at 10 o'clock, Christmas Day and New Year's Day. So we are still in the season of Advent, um, and last week we lit the candle of hope, and this week we have the candle of preparation. And so I'm going to invite the Collins family to come up uh, and light the second candle, the candle of preparation. Uh, And as they do that, I'm going to read uh, from Isaiah 40, verses 3 through 5. And it says, A voice cries in the wilderness, Prepare the way of the Lord. And make straight in the desert a highway for our God. Every valley shall be lifted up, and every mountain and hill be made low. The uneven ground shall become level, and the rough places a plain. And the glory of the Lord shall be revealed, and all flesh shall see it together, for the mouth of the Lord has spoken. Would you pray with me? So, Lord Jesus, in this life, there are all kinds of things fighting for our attention. There will always be distractions and whatever mountains there may be in our life that are keeping us from seeing you fully. Lord, I pray that those mountains will be brought low so that we can behold your glory. And I pray this morning that we would prepare our hearts to meet with you and to worship you. And Lord, we know that if we come to you this morning with with any unconfessed and unrepentant sin in our own heart, What we're doing is not worship, but it's hypocrisy. So God, let us turn from every sin and prepare our hearts to see you in all your glory. We are starving for the glory of God, and we are desperate to see you in your glory. So God, give us eyes to see this this morning. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Good will 
unto all the earth and these divine. All of the earth rejoice, it's Christmas time, it's Christmas time. So lift up your voice and sing out his praise, it's Christmas, born is the King, rejoice in the day. And sing out his praise. It's Christmas. Born is the King. Rejoice in the day. It's Christmas. Make a joyful sound. It's Christmas. Let his praise resound. It's Christmas. So, Buddy the Elf says that the best way to spread Christmas cheer is to sing loud for all to hear. So now it's y'all's turn. So if you would stand, and we'll sing, Hark the Herald Angels Sing. Hark the herald angels sing, glory to the newborn King. Peace on earth and mercy mild, God and sinners reconciled. Joyful all ye nations rise, join the triumph of the Proclaim, Christ is born in Bethlehem. Hark the herald angels sing, glory to the newborn King. Angels, we have heard on high, sweetly singing o'er the plains.
nature sing and heaven and heaven nature sing joy to the earth the savior reigns let men their songs employ while fields and floods sparks hills and plains repeat the sounding joy Repeat the sounding joy, repeat, repeat the sounding joy. Amen. Y'all may be seated. Well, amen. It is great to be back with you this Sunday. Last Sunday, I was in New York City, so it is good to be back with you. Last Sunday, we went with a group of 14 from our church to be on mission We went alongside of about 25 North and South Carolina churches, and we worked alongside of about 20 New York churches. There were 20 different sites all across New York City. We were part of an outreach called Coats for the City. That was an outreach that you helped make a reality. All during the fall, we were taking up coats and scarves and gloves and all those types of things. I was really just blown away when we got there to find out that between all the churches, We had raised 5,000 coats and about 2,500 other items, scarves, gloves, that type of thing. And so church, I just want to say thank you. Thank you for your generosity, your kindness. And when it comes to a mission trip, I could stand up here all day and talk about why we go and the benefits of it. But for me personally, one of the things that I always take away is those who go with me. As we go on mission, what I find is that it is those people often that I serve alongside of that I'm often the closest. And it's usually those people that I serve with that I know the best. And often that's a good thing. Sometimes maybe it's not such a good thing. But we get to know each other in ways that we never would otherwise. And so I could stand up here and talk all day about what God did for me. But I want to give two an opportunity that came on the trip with me. And so Ricky and Ann, if y'all want to stand even just where you are. Um, so I want to introduce you one at a time. This is Ricky Hustis. He's one of our deacons here. And then also this is my new hero. This is Ann Williams. Ann Williams went and was such a trooper getting along the city, the subway, the buses, even when her tour guide, and we won't name his name, might have got lost a couple of times. She did not complain one time. We're not going to point or cause any fingers or anything like that. So first, Ricky. Ricky, first tell us a little bit about what you did and what you kind of added to the outreach on that Saturday morning. All right, sure. Uh, First off, uh, me and my family were blessed by going. I mean, it, it was a great experience. First time for uh, me, my wife, and my daughter, Emily. First time to New York City. Uh, first time to a city that large. So, but, uh, uh, yeah, when uh, we got up early Saturday morning, and we went down to uh, Grace uh, Baptist Church in Brooklyn, uh, where uh, Pastor Christopher uh, is the pastor. And when we walked in there in the fellowship hall, and... Uh, Seen all these bags still sealed, and there was quite a few of them. Like Nathan said, we had a lot of coats and hats and whatnot. So first thing uh, me and my family done was starting to rip open the bags. On one side, it was me and my wife working, and on the other side, uh, Pastor Nathan and another gentleman. I can't remember his name. but uh, So uh, we were trying to keep uh, one side of the room men's, uh, one side of the room ladies, but still we had to go through the bags and sort them out by size. Uh, and then after that, uh, of course, uh, I was uh, assigned outside, which I loved. So uh, it was me, Pastor Nathan, Mark Steelman. We were outside, and, and it was raining. So it, it wasn't a pleasant day. It was kind of <laughs> cool and rainy, but uh, still, we had a blast. Uh, uh, one thing I uh, uh, kind of got a kick out of is, uh, of course, we had paper signs, uh, billboard size type, uh, and... Uh, we just use magic marker to, you know, let people know that free coats come on inside and everything. But after a while with the rain and everything, uh, of course, the ink started getting on uh, Pastor Nathan's hands and uh, even Mark Steelman's hands and the paper started tearing because it got wet. So just for the record, we're holding the signs. Ricky's holding the umbrella. I'll let y'all <laughs> yeah, figure yeah. that out. <laughs> yeah, okay. <laughs> yeah. I took the easy route. <laughs> no. But anyway, so I, I really enjoyed it. Uh, 
trying to communicate with the people going by, but again, I don't know if half of them understood me or not. I couldn't understand their language, but uh, so a lot of it was kind of like sign language, like, uh, you know, free coats, come on inside type of thing. But uh, yeah, so that's uh, what I did. That was my part and uh, my family's part. Uh, my daughter and uh, wife were inside taking care of things. So, All right, Miss Ann, tell us a little bit about what you did as part of the outreach. Well, my job, uh, I helped a little bit with the coats, but not too much. I was in charge of making some uh, couple uh, coffee pots full of hot chocolate uh, <laughs> for the people uh, and have snacks, some snacks there. So that I had a good cushy job <laughs> and every, everybody liked me and uh, <laughs> the people spoke Spa a lot of Spanish and uh, so I got to brush up on my high school Spanish you know in <laughs> escuela and I'd say a word or two and oh they they'd be happy I did remember husband when she started to introduce her husband and I said esposo <laughs> and see sí, see sí. so that was fun and uh, <clears throat> it was just uh a, a great job to be able to see all the people and to greet them and and uh, just uh, and I was telling before I think one of the highlights for me part of that was afterwards they served us lunch and they made uh, rice chicken roasted chicken and all kinds of rice and salads and it was really good just to see all the Church ladies and the church people, they're all the same, whether you're in Nor New York City or you're in Minnesota or you're in South Carolina. People are people. We, we all love Jesus, and that's where we all belong. Amen. The second question, you can go in any order you want, but we go to bless, but often the blessing is ours. So what did one, maybe two things, did God teach you as individuals on the trip? Well, God taught me that all people um, are the same, and and uh, I think what taught me was that that um, when I, I think I'm I'm giving something, I'm more blessed by by being able to to give. And God just taught me that that uh, no matter where you are, people are going to help. <clears throat> I was going all around on the subways and the buses with a walker, and then I could sit down. And uh, I don't know how many times I would be sitting down and all of a sudden there'd be this hand mm. and somebody would help me up, you know, and they would be up oh, over here. And here I came in, we'd get into the subway and people would get up, you know, no matter how old and they would get up and give you your seat. And, and so it, that meant a lot to me just to, to be able to, to um, you know, see all that. Here we think we're doing, you know, but you really... Are, are receiving so much more. Yeah, just to reiterate the last part she said, yeah, you, you think you're giving, but you receive a whole lot more. I mean, I, I felt it uh, within my heart. And um, again, uh, so many, it, it humbled me to see so many different ethnic groups, so many languages I didn't know. I, I, I was one that uh, when I went through high school, Spanish was an elective, so I elected not to take it. <laughs> so uh, I wish I would have. But uh, anyway, so I, I had no idea what people were saying a lot of times, but still, uh, it, it's amazing how you still can communicate as human beings. And uh, um, everybody was uh, gracious, and uh, we definitely were blessed. Um, I can honestly say that, uh, yeah, we've seen sites and Rockefeller Center and stuff like that, even me. A couple of our families and the ladies went to different plays. That was great. But overall, the mission is what really touched me most, and I got most out of it. So uh, definitely, if you've never been to New York City, I'd highly recommend it. And even uh, more if you're going as a group on a mission because you get a lot more out of it. And uh, and I another thing I got is that as I looked around, I told in first service, is uh, holding on the subway, trying to keep my balance and all that in the buses, uh, you look around and you see so many different people uh, and it makes you have compassion and realize no matter what your skin color is, no matter what you speak, we're all creations of God and we, and every human being deserves that respect and that's what we're called to do and uh, so that's what really humbled me just seeing that. Uh, it, it truly is a melting pot up there and I want to thank Pastor Nathan 
because he was our navigator, and he did a good job. Even Most though of I give him a hard time, but he, <laughs> he did a great job, and he was always looking back to make sure everybody was everybody was there. And his wife Kelly helped out too. So uh, a lot of times he'd take the front of the train, and she'd take the back of the walking train down the roads and stuff, uh, weaving in and out of the crowds. But it it was great. Uh, one last person I want to thank uh, also because uh, is my daughter because as this was coming up, we were sitting in the pews, and she said, uh, Pastor Nathan was talking about the trip, and if you want to go, sign up and all this. And she goes, Daddy, let's go. And I said, I don't know. That's a big city. I don't know if I want to go. <laughs> you know, I'm not a big city person. And she said, but, Daddy, it's a mission. Mm-hmm. And, oh, <laughs> so, you know, what can you do? <laughs> so I said, okay, let's give it a shot. So, so thank you. And, uh, Good job, man. Thanks for all your support. So that kind of leads me to my very last question, and I'm going to ask Ann if she could answer this. So, Ann, believe it or not, as a pastor, I hear of a lot of excuses at times. Why people can't do this or they can't do that, especially when it comes on mission trips. They'll, uh, we won't go into all the excuses, but someone will say, well, I can't go because of this or that. So, I will, Ann, I want you to give them a talking to this morning. If someone says, I can't go, what would you say to them? Well, I know I heard a lot of people say, what, you're going to go? You shouldn't go. Your health is not. Well, you shouldn't go. It's oh, you know. <clears throat> but I appreciate the people said go, go. I remember Jeff and CVS said, uh, "You going to New York?" And I said, "The doctor said I could go." And he said, "Good, good." That meant a lot. And and uh, when people that say they can't go, why are you sitting home? I mean, like like Emily said and uh, Ricky said, it's a mission trip and. You, you think you're giving, but you get so much more. And uh, it's not, it, it, it just seems like God gives you the energy and the spirit. I didn't think I could be, I think I saw every crack in the New York City <laughs> sidewalks. And one, one time, Ricky, Ricky, Ricky pushed me. He had me sitting in my chair, and he pushed me, and we hit a big bump, and I about went to the pavement. Um, so we we really had a good time, and you would you would benefit so many people, and don't be afraid to go because you have something to offer, and as part of Jesus' family. Church, let's give them a round of applause. Thank you both. Well, this time our ushers are going to come down, our deacons going to pray for our offering, and then church, let's give joyfully and let's give generously. Norm. Father, I thank you so much as a young Christian that a pastor says, you don't have to give, Norm, you get to give. And thank you, Father, for your Holy Spirit and now that I want to give. Father, help us to be joyful givers, that we can see your work in action, that we can see missions going to New York City. We can see missions around the community. Father, just ask you to bless these tithes and offerings, that we remember everything you have belongs to you. In your name. Amen. Go tell it on the mountain over the hills and everywhere go tell it on the mountain that jesus christ is born while shepherds kept their watching or silent flocks by night behold throughout the heavens there shone a holy light. Go tell it on the mountain, over the hills and everywhere. Go tell it on the mountain that Jesus Christ is born. Y'all stand with us and say, the shepherds feared and trembled when to above the earth rang out the angels.
angel chorus that hails the Savior's birth. Go tell it on the mountain, over the hills and everywhere. Go tell it on the mountain that Jesus Christ is born. That blessed Christmas morn Go tell it on the mountain Over the hills and everywhere Go tell it on the mountain That Jesus Christ is born Well, as our choir makes its way down, we're also going to take this time to dismiss our kids for Children's Church. And as they go, let's give them another round of applause for their singing this morning. But for us today, we are going to make our way to Matthew chapter 1 as we continue our Christmas series, considering the hope that we have as Christians this time of year. Because I'm reminded in the Bible, the concept of hope It's not just an idea. It's not just an action. It's not just a religion. No, the series title is intentional. Hope has a name. Hope has a name. Today we are considering the hope that the person and work of Jesus Christ gives us this time of year and throughout the entire year. We spent the first two weeks of this series in the Old Testament looking forward to the coming Messiah. Now we're going to camp out for the next three weeks in the book of Matthew of the reality of the hope that we have in Jesus. Now, until now, I imagine you've probably been tracking with this series fairly well until today. If you've looked at the newsletter or if you maybe glanced at the bulletin and you saw the passage for this morning, you're probably thinking, Pastor, what are you thinking? What on earth are you thinking this morning? Don't you know that Bible reading plans usually go pretty well until we get to genealogies? Then we just kind of skim over them as fast as we can and move on to the next thing. What are you really thinking here, Pastor? Well, I'll admit this morning that this will be an unconventional Christmas message, but what I want to show you is this, is that through this genealogy, through generation after generation, is embedded gospel gold, nuggets of gospel gold. Even one Jewish um, person by the name of Marvin Rosenthal, his testimony is that he gave his life to Jesus as the Messiah when he read this very genealogy. So this morning, I want us to read the genealogy. I want to encourage you to read it with fresh eyes. And I want you to read it not through a historical lens, but a gospel lens. So today I'm going to invite Addison Johnson. She's going to come and read the genealogy for us, and then we will dive in together. Addison. The book of the genealogy of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. Abraham was the father of Isaac, and Isaac the father of Jacob, and Jacob the father of Judah and his brothers, and Judah the father of Perez and Zerah by Tamar, and Perez the father of Hezron, and Hezron the father of Ram, and Ram the father of Amenadab, and Amenadab the father of Nashon, and Nashon the father of Salam, and Salam the father of Boaz by Rahab, and Boaz the father of Obed by Ruth, and Obed the father of Jesse, and Jesse the father of David the king. And David was the father of Solomon by the wife of Uriah, and Solomon the father of Rehoboam, and Rehoboam the father of Abijah, and Abijah the father of Asaph, and Asaph the father of Jehoshaphat, and Jehoshaphat the father of Jerome, and Jerome the father of Uzziah, and Uzziah the father of Jotham, 
and Jotham the father of Ahaz, and Ahaz the father of Hezekiah, and Hezekiah the father of Manasseh, and Manasseh the father of Amos, and Amos the father of Josiah, and Josiah the father of Jeconiah and his brothers, at the time of the deportation to Babylon. And after the deportation to Babylon, Jeconiah was the father of Shealtiel, and Shealtiel the father of Zerubbabel, and Zerubbabel the father of Abidin, and Abidin the father of Elikim, and Elikim the father of Azor, and Azor the father of Zadok, and Zadok the father of Achim, and Achim the father of Eliad, and Eliad the father of Eleazar, and Eleazar the father of Mathen, and Mathen the father of Jacob, and Jacob the father of Joseph the husband of Mary, of whom Jesus was born, who is called Christ. So all the generations from Abraham to David were fourteen generations, and from David to the deportation to Babylon, fourteen generations, and from the deportation to Babylon to the Christ, fourteen generations. This is the word of the Lord. Church, let's give her a round of applause for that one. (laughs) For us as Westerners, we are very individualistic. We praise the self-made man or the self-made woman. We don't give a whole lot of thought to our family lineage or our ancestry, especially when we compare ourselves to other cultures especially Eastern cultures, even like the culture that the Bible was written in, genealogies matter. It matters because it defines who you are and what your purpose and even your status in life is. For a Jew, your genealogy showed you what land that you could purchase and own. It showed you what your status in life. It shared a lot about who you were and what your importance in life was. I'll never forget about 10 years ago, I went through my family genealogy, my family ancestry, and I traced the sweet family line. I traced this back to Tennessee, then to Virginia, even across the Atlantic. But what stood out to me the most was when I found a lot about my grandfather, J.C. Sweet, one of my heroes, World War II veteran. And I saw, even there on the screen, many of the paperwork that he had from the war. Many of the things that he did, it showed me a lot more about who he was. And by knowing more about who he was, it showed me a little bit more, I think, about who I am. It gave me a great sense of pride of where I had come from and the values that were instilled in me. And so I recognized that my genealogy was defining for me how much more defining is the genealogy of Jesus. Now, in this genealogy, what I want you to see this morning is I think Matthew shows us at least two critical truths about who Jesus is. Number one, he is going to show us that Jesus alone is the true and the eternal king. But secondly, that this king is not just some cold, distant tyrant, but the true and eternal king is also the gracious and the redeeming king. So, number one, let's look at this idea together. Matthew shows us that Jesus is the true and eternal King. Matthew begins and ends this section with a bookend that shows us his entire message in this genealogy. Verse 1 says this is the book of the genealogy of Jesus Christ. Skip down to verse 16. It says, Jacob, the father of Joseph, the husband of Mary, of whom Jesus was born, who was called what? Christ. Matthew is making the claim that Jesus is the Christ. Remember, Christ is not Jesus' last name, it's his title. Christ meaning that he was the long-awaited Messiah. He was the King and the Redeemer, not just of Israel, but for the entire world. So Matthew is making this very profound claim, and then he spends the rest of the entire Gospel of Matthew writing predominantly to a Jewish audience to show them that Jesus is the Messiah. Now, if Matthew's goal here was to introduce to us some average person or some type of a servant, there would be no genealogy. Why? Because the genealogy of a servant is irrelevant. But for a king, it matters entirely. 
If you remember just a few months ago as Queen Elizabeth died and there was the question of who was the next successor to the throne. I remember Kelly and I that night, we got online and we looked at all of the royal family lineage. Why was it this person and not this person? Why was it King Charles and not someone else that had the right to the throne? The answer, only those with the right lineage has a right to the throne. You see, to a Jew, they would have asked the question, who is Jesus? He's a carpenter from nowhere. He has no education. He has no power. He has no significance or influence. Why would they want Jesus as the king? Matthew says it is because Jesus alone has the right lineage to the throne. He alone is the rightful heir. And what I find fascinating even more so is that scholars point out that since the destruction of the temple in the year A.D. 70, There is no living Jew that can trace their lineage now back to David. Why? Because all the records are gone. Therefore, there is only one verifiable line that can be traced back to David and back to Abraham. And that line is the line of Jesus himself. That's why verse 1, he begins by tracing Jesus back to those two key men, Abraham and David. Remember, Abraham was the father of Israel. In Genesis chapter 12, God comes to Abraham and promises three things. The third of which being that through the line of Abraham, all of the world would be blessed as a result. Matthew says that Jesus himself is that blessing. And then remember, David is Israel's model king. And we see Nathan the prophet in 2 Samuel 7 coming to David and promising him that his throne would be established for all eternity. Matthew says, Jesus is that anointed king, the one who has come to reign for all eternity. And that's what Matthew then begins to set out to do, making connection after connection with three groups of 14. 14 people from Abraham to David, 14 from David to the deportation, from 14 then from the deportation to Jesus. Now, likely, this is not an exhaustive list. Some would even say this is more of a poetic device that likely Matthew isn't putting every single person that he could have in the list. And actually, it's even unclear as to some of who these people are, especially during the exile. We don't know exactly who each of these individuals are. But regardless, Matthew is making at least two profound statements about Jesus. He is telling us that Jesus is the only true king. Matthew shows, notice, Israel has had leader after leader, king after king, and yet each one of them failed. They all failed. During the patriarchs, Abraham, yes, had great faith at times, yet he was also a coward. He would lie about his wife, Sarah, being his sister two times to two different kings so that he could save himself. Judah, we know that it was his idea to sell his brother Joseph into slavery and then lie about it. So the question during that time was, who can we put our hope into? Then we consider the time of the monarchy. That's the time of the kings. We consider David. Yes, he was a man after God's own heart, but we also see him commit adultery and then murder. We think of Solomon marrying hundreds of women and worshiping countless idols at the time. We know that there were a few good kings, but the vast majority were wicked men. The vast majority were corrupt and led the nation of Israel into corruption and idol worship. The question then was, who will lead us? And then during the time of the exile, it was a time of great darkness and despair As Israel was stripped not only from their homes, but of their freedom. And the question then would have been, who will deliver us? You see, my concern is that a lot of times when we read the Bible, we read it with somewhat of a skewed lens. We read these characters of the Bible almost as the heroes of the Bible, wanting to put them on a pedestal as if we need to imitate those individuals. And sure, many of them did good things, but overall what you see is that most of them are a bunch of failures. Many of them sinning 
absolutely tragically. But through that, that's when you see that it is then God's strength overcoming human weakness. That it is then He often uses the least likely to show how abundantly strong He is. So when you read the Old Testament, what you see is that each of these people were not good enough. Abraham was a failure. David was a failure. Hezron was a failure. Ram, a failure. Nashon, a failure. Jeconiah, a failure. Uzziah, a failure. With each passing generation, our hope in mankind and man-made systems is stripped away for our hope to save us. But that's when it hits us. The hero of the Bible are not these men and women. The hero of the Bible is Jesus himself. He is the one that stands in victory where every man and woman that has come before and lives today and ever will come stands in failure. Jesus stands in victory. He alone is qualified to sit on the throne. So today, I don't know where you find yourself. But Matthew, through this genealogy, is pleading with you, don't put your hope into men. Don't put your hope into religions. Don't put your hope into man-made governments. They will only disappoint you time and time again. Put your hope in the sovereign king of the universe, and that alone is Jesus himself. But not only is he the true king, Matthew then goes to show us that Jesus is the eternal king. Notice the trend. Notice how Matthew structures this. Three key seasons in the history of Israel. Before the monarchy, which would have been a time of wandering, a time of despair, a time of promise, but also a time of doubt. You see the time during the monarchy, that is the kings, it was a time of corruption with wicked leadership. And then you see the time of the exile, which again was a time of great despair. You see, if you were to take your lens and zoom in on each one of those periods or each one of those persons, you would have seen likely hopelessness questioning, doubts, despair. God, where are you? God, what are you doing during this time? But instead, if you were to zoom out and see the big picture, what you would see is at each moment, Christ was sitting on the throne. While at each individual moment, they might not have seen God at work, Matthew reminds us that this is a perfectly orchestrated plan where God's sovereignty is at work every step of the way. Notice, Matthew is saying 14 generations, 14 generations, 14 generations. This is a perfectly designed plan by the sovereign God Himself. See, sometimes people might wonder, why is it That God sent Jesus when He did. Why didn't God send Jesus to us now? I mean, can you think about what Jesus could have done with modern technology? I mean, could you think about what Jesus could have done with Twitter and social media to the entire world? Could you think about what Jesus could have done with YouTube? You were in a debate with somebody and they said, I don't believe in Jesus. Well, you could pull up the video and show them the miracle yourself. Why is it that God sent Jesus when he did well you'll see the answer on the screen galatians 4 verse 4 says it this way but when the fullness of time had come god sent forth his son god sent jesus at the perfect exact moment in the middle of god's sovereignty the centerpiece of human history is found none other in the manger jesus came at god's perfect timing. He is the eternal King who has reigned, is reigning, and will reign for all eternity. So it doesn't matter where you find yourself today, no matter when, no matter what, no matter who, through slavery, through freedom, through corruption, to integrity, Jesus is reigning and He is working all things out for His glory and ultimately for your good. You see, this morning, if I could do anything for some of you in this room, it would be this, to zoom out, to zoom out from your current circumstances. You see, this is a reminder, and and I know that for some of you, this is going to be a shocking 
statement, so hold on to your seats. The world is not about you. History, I heard the gas, I'm on gas, I know, you can't believe it, right? History is not about you. The world isn't about you and your wants and your preferences. It isn't about either this time period. Yes, God loves those that are alive now, but He loved those that lived 3,000 years ago just as much. It isn't just about this nation. I love my nation, but also people that are from Africa, Asia, Iraq, North Korea are just as precious in the eyes of the Lord. It isn't about your circumstances either. If you ever hear someone say that this is the worst time of human history, that only proves one thing to me. They've never read a history book. You see, it's not about this time period and just about us. When you zoom out and you see that God's plan and His sovereignty is so much more than we can possibly imagine, and He is working even in ways that you cannot imagine. I love how David Platt says it. He says, quote, You are not at the center of history. I am not at the center of history. Our generation is not at the center of history. The United States of America is not at the center of history. Billions have come and billions have gone. Empires have come and empires have gone. Countries, nations, kings, queens, and presidents have come and gone. But at the center of it all stands one person, and his name is Jesus Christ. He alone is the true and the eternal king. Yet then Matthew, I think, makes another statement, and that is this. He is the true and eternal king, but he is not a cold and distant king. No, secondly, he is the gracious and the redeeming king. You see, this genealogy, in my opinion, is one of the proofs of the reality of the gospel. You say, Nathan, how so? Well, think about it this way. Today, if I were to ask you to make up the genealogy of God, how would you do it? If I said, hey, we're going to make up a fabricated genealogy for God and just make this up, how would you do it? Well, most of us, I think, would think about really good people or really influential people or really religious people with really good reputations. We would probably think of people like Billy Graham or Annie Armstrong, Lottie Moon, or some great missionary like Jim Elliott. That's not what we have here. Folks, what we have here is a ragtag group of misfits and sinners. And yet interwoven through this genealogy is what one pastor described as the scarlet thread of redemption. Today, I want to give you three ways that this genealogy points to the gospel. You'll see these on the screen. Three ways that the genealogy shows the gospel. Number one, it shows that the gospel is for the powerful and the insignificant. Notice in the genealogy, we see patriarchs and we see kings. But don't miss it. In this genealogy, we have five women. Five women. Now that's significant. Because you see, at that time, if you were trying to trace a genealogy, especially for a king, you would not have put women in that genealogy. In that time, a woman's testimony was not even valid in the court of law. But what Matthew shows us is the gospel is doing something radically different. The gospel is not just for the male. It is not just for the powerful. No, the gospel is for the male and the female alike. The gospel is for the rich and for the poor. The gospel is for the significant and the insignificant. The gospel is for the CEO and for the homeless. The gospel is for all peoples. It doesn't matter how powerful you are this morning. We all stand level at the foot of the cross. The second thing Matthew shows us is the gospel is also for all peoples. You see, if you were an Israelite at that time, you would have been very passionate about keeping your bloodline pure. There was a racial divide. There was an us versus them mentality. Those people over there, we're going to let them stay over here. We're just going to stay here with people that are like us. But what Matthew shows us is that the gospel bridges the gap between ethnic and socioeconomic barriers. 
Notice, Tamar and Rahab, they were both Canaanites. Ruth was from, she was a Moabite. Bathsheba, the wife of Uriah, he was a Hittite. Who were they? They were Gentiles. Nasty, stinky, we don't want nothing to do with those Gentiles. No self-respecting Jew would have ever let a Gentile into their home. We're going to stay over here. We're going to let the Gentiles kind of do their thing over there. But through the gospel, ethnic and socioeconomic barriers are shattered at the foot of the cross. I love Paul's words in Galatians. He says, now there is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither slave nor free. There is no male or female. Why? For you are all one in Christ Jesus. Now this morning, I want to make a statement. And it might be a hard statement. But I want you to know that I make this statement in love. Today, if you want First Baptist Surfside, to only be a church of people who are like you, who look like you, who dress like you, who sing like you, that think like you, that speak the same language as you do, who have the same skin color as you do and are the same age as you, then you want something fundamentally different than what God wants for this church. And what you want, therefore, is not a church. It's a temple of worship to only yourself. This week, when we went to New York City, you've already heard, 9 million people, 800 languages spoken. As Ricky said, as we sat there on the street corner, I didn't understand much of what was said to me. And for some, I recognize that diversity is a scary thing. We want to sometimes hold those that are different from us at arm's length. But for me... It's absolutely beautiful. It's a reminder that God is a creative God, that He loves, yes, those that are from South Carolina, but for New York, Venezuela, Iraq, they are all made in His image and are worthy of our love and our respect. And if they are made in the image and the likeness of God and we reject them, then we are rejecting the one in whose image they are made. What does it say about us if we reject the person that Jesus died on the cross to save. You see, we say in our mission statement, church, that we are here, we exist. Why? To engage the nations with the gospel. My question is, will that just be something we write on a piece of paper? Or is it something that we will actually live out? Because what I recognize, we cannot reach the nations for the gospel until we have a heart of love for the nations. My prayer as we enter into 2023 is that as a church, one of my main prayers for our church is that God would work within us to give us a heart for the nations, a heart for all people, that we would love others as Christ first loved us. The third and last thing is this. The genealogy reminds us that the gospel is not just for the religious, not just for the clean. The gospel is for the sinner. Look at this list. Again, I see nothing but a bunch of failures. We see Tamar. Now, I'm not going to get into all the details of Tamar, but we know that she would disguise herself as a prostitute to trick her father-in-law Judah to giving her a rightful heir. We know Judah, on the other hand, he lied and he sought after a prostitute. It was a scandal that would make any modern-day reality TV look fairly tame at this time. Yet we know that God would work through Judah. Genesis 49.10 promises that through Judah, the scepter shall not depart from Judah. We see Rahab. She didn't just pretend to be a prostitute. That was her professional career. Yet, the writer of Hebrews, in Hebrews chapter 11, would list her among the Paul of faith. Those who would have great faith in the Lord. We know that she would be the one who would hide and protect the spies there from Israel. And as a result, fearing God, then she would be a woman of great faith. Then we see David and Bathsheba. Now scholars debate as to what actually happened here and who really was to blame, whether this was consensual or whether it was not. 
But it's hard to see Bathsheba not being taken advantage of on some level. We see sin after sin after sin. And that's just scratching the surface. Yet in the face of such impurity, notice how Matthew ends in verse 16. He says, And Jacob, the father of Joseph, the husband of who? Mary. Of whom Jesus was born, who was called the Christ. Now, this doesn't mean that Mary was spotless or sinless. But what it does show is that in the midst of such impurity and sin, who comes? A pure virgin. And this pure virgin would be with child. And this child would live the perfect, sinless, spotless life. He would grow into a man and he would go to the cross to bear the weight of the sin that we deserve. There on the cross, He would take the full wrath of God that you and I deserve in an everlasting hell. There on the cross, He would die the death that you deserve so that then you could live the life that you don't deserve. And this is a reminder, I think from the rooftops, Matthew is screaming today, that it does not matter who you are or what you've done. It doesn't matter how terrible your past sin may be in your mind. God loves you. He died for you. And today, if you would simply put your faith and your trust in Him, it's not about being a good person. It's not about being a more religious person. This shows us that you can't be. All of these people tried to be good enough on their own, and they couldn't. But by simple faith and trust in Jesus, today you would be forgiven. You would be made new. You would be granted everlasting life because the king took the form of a servant, even the form of a baby. Who would grow into a man to die for you. So today, I want to end by asking three questions. Three application questions. You'll see them on the screen as well. Three questions for you. Number one, is this genealogy your genealogy? You see, the beauty of the gospel is that when we give our life to Christ, the story of Christ isn't just a story. It becomes your story has your life been so transformed by the gospel of jesus christ that the story of the manger the cross and the empty tomb is not just something we celebrate one day a year but it is a life-defining story-altering reality in your life number two do you have a heart for the nations is your heart the heart of god let me just simply ask it this way How many people do you know in your life that are not like you? Do you know somebody that is different than you? If not, who is somebody that you can get to know on a personal level? Maybe it's that person you see fairly regularly at the restaurant. Or maybe that neighbor that moved in next door that you haven't introduced yourself to. How can you get to know them and hear their story, not just somebody at arm's length, but hear their story as someone made in the image and the likeness of God? Who do you love that is different from you, but is still made in the image of God? And then third and last, who can you love in the name of Christ? Jesus is the true King. But remember, He is the gracious and the redeeming King. And I love how Matthew ends, because what he then does is through the entire Gospel of Matthew, sets out to prove that Jesus is the King. But then we see the King in Matthew 28, about to ascend into heaven, and the King looks at His disciples and then to us, and He says, all authority has been given to Me. I am the true King, He says. And then he says, and you'll see it on the screen, Matthew 28, 19 through 20. Go therefore and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. The King of kings and the Lord of lords has commanded that we as his followers go and make disciples, not just of Surfside, but of all nations. Recently, in the Baptist press, I came across an article from a church in Louisiana. It got my attention because it said this church in Louisiana, for 58 weeks, had someone in the baptistry waters. 
58 weeks, more than a year, they had to fill the baptistry waters and baptize sometimes more than one person on a Sunday. So I was interested. I wanted to see what's the secret, what's the grand formula or the new evangelism strategy to make this happen? Why can't something like that happen here at First Baptist Surfside? So I read the article when the pastor was interviewed. The first thing he said was he gave all the credit to the Lord. He said, this is something we could have never comprehended in our entire lives. But here was the big secret. The secret was, quote, our folks have been faithful to invite. That was the grand strategy. They didn't have some grand new formula to make disciples. It was simply that the people of the church so in love with Jesus, got over themselves and went and loved others in the name of Jesus and invited them to church and shared the gospel with them. Church, is our heart more for programs and preferences and policies or is our heart more for people? People who need to hear about Jesus Christ. My prayer is that we would even more so in 2023 look beyond the walls of this church to a world that is lost and in need of a Savior. Let me ask you this way. What if I told you today that your next door neighbor was hurting? Their marriage was on the rocks. They were hopeless and lonely and that if death came to their door, they would spend an eternity in hell but that if just one person would go across the yard and invite them to church, they would come give their lives to Christ and their lives would be radically transformed. If I told you that and that was a certainty, what would you do? I imagine 99% of us would go and invite them this very afternoon. Now, I'm not claiming to say that that happens all the time, if not even most of the time, but it does happen a lot of the time. We have people all around us. We don't necessarily see it, but they are hurting, they are lost, and they're hopeless. We have been given the gospel of Jesus Christ. It is not our job then to just be keepers of that for us, but to be the light and the darkness for those who need it. So Matthew shows us the genealogy. I pray that you will never read this genealogy the same way again. The king was promised The true king has come, and the gracious king is reigning for all eternity. The last question is this, who is your king? Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this word, and God, we thank you that through every word of the Bible is the gospel, that for every letter, for every period is the gospel, that the gospel is found even in a genealogy. And Lord, I pray that we would recognize your love and your grace for us even through this genealogy today. God, I pray for that person in this room who perhaps is here for the first time or maybe that God, they're searching. Lord, maybe they would claim not to be a Christian today. But God, I pray that the gospel would shine in their light as it never has before. Lord, maybe they've known facts about you, but God, I pray that you would today meet them where they are and draw them to the Savior. God, we love you and we thank you. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. In just a moment, we're going to stand and we're going to sing our song of response. It's time for you simply to pray and ask God, how do I need to respond to your word? Whether that needs to be something that happens there in the pew, after church, maybe you want to come and pray with Pastor Adam or myself. Maybe you want to ask, how can I give my life to Jesus? How can I join and be a part of the church today? Whatever the case is. Let me simply challenge you to not leave here today without walking in obedience. Would you stand and would you sing?
guess that's my cue. <laughs> Church, thanks for gathering again with us today. Now, I want to see quiz time. You were listening to Adam this morning when he did the announcements. We're meeting today at what time for caroling? Four o'clock. Hey, they were listening, man. Good job. So today, four o'clock, come out and carol with us. It's going to be a great time, food and snacks afterwards. But now we've gathered. Let's go and be the church. Have a great day.